words. David was just such an excellent speaker, so I write my memo to um, Anyway, so noir fiction, um, yeah, it's a, it's a big genre, and um, you know, the EPL probably has close to 400 items. And so um, I've gone about this in a rather light-hearted way, given the, the, the nature of the genre. Um, anyway, that we can see from about 1937. Um, and you can see there's a couple of big writers there. There's Raymond Chandler, of course, highlighted. And, um, and, and Paul Kane, not to be confused with James M. Kane. So, uh, okay. So you can see here that um, noir fiction is not doesn't take place in polite society. It's 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 the other extreme of cozies, let's say, and um, it basically I mean the premise is that um, things might start off reasonably well, they'll soon go downhill. Quite often they'll start in a bad way and go downhill. In noir fiction, um, you might think, oh, really? But just about inevitably, someone's lying, um, staring at the ceiling, contemplating the meaning of life. And I mean, there's lots of fiction, obviously, that has sort of a dark element to it. But I, I, I honestly believe, having read hundreds of novels, which is very unhealthy, um, of this genre, um, that it, it, noir it has to have a hard-boiled element to it. It does, uh, as well as this dark sort of existential concern of doom. Right. Um, so it, there are lots of subgenres, and here's a sort of comedic one. But again, it's got this kind of um, underlying sense of um, unease. I rather like the sort of, you know, down under, which is why I started off with a quote. I mean, I'm letting these noir fictions speak for themselves, basically. Um, so this is from the classic genre. Basically, there are two periods, the golden age of noir, which is from mid-1930s to around 1965, 70, and then everything since then. Um, uh, many of the noir writers, uh, uh, it, it ties in with film noir, of course, uh, the noir writers, many, uh, particularly Cornell Woolridge and, uh, and James M. Kane had their, um, for films, uh, their books adapted into film. So, post-war, post-Second World War, those, those are Hitler youth in case of Everybody smokes. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much in the newer noir, but everybody drinks. <laughs> and they combine that with drugs quite often, and various other kinds. Typically, um, uh, a film they talk, but not always, not necessarily, but typically there is. And the chum, the patsy, the fool guy. So I think this chump's actually a key part because the chump, of course, is a protagonist and, or a secondary character, usually a protagonist, um, he, well, you'll see, but it, things don't go well. And in fact, in this particular actor, things didn't go well. He, he wound up in jail for murdering another actor and died. <laughs> So, 
Royal Fiction does spend a fair bit of time describing the looks of people in usually fairly amusing ways. And of course, it's quite often, I mean, there's somebody investigating something inevitably in noir. Um, you know, usually some heinous crime. And then the police get involved. Now, the police, um, even police procedurals, are usually a bit um, grey, a bit shifty, a bit shady. Um, I'm looking for that red flag. <laughs> um, almost done. So, uh, quite often uh, they are the bad guys. And you can be pretty sure someone's going to get knocked out, in this case with a fist, quite often with a blunt instrument. And poor people use guns. Actually, there's some exceptions. European noir guns are used, but not as often in North American as in North American noir. And there's often snappy dialogue, more so in the older kind of golden age of noir. There was a lot of snappy dialogue. Dialogue, a lot of emphasis was put on that. Um, the newer one, well, it's there, but it's not trying to be quite self subconsciously clever. And somebody pretty well dies, at least one person will be dead.